Uh, welcome to uh, the Astrobiology Seminar today at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm Rory Barnes. I'm going to be hosting uh, the seminar today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Juan Perez Mecarer from Harvard University's uh, Department of Earth and Planetary Science and the Origin of Life Initiative. Uh, Juan is, uh, uh, has had a very uh, illustrious career at traveling to a lot of different places, um, a huge breadth of experience, so we're really delighted to have him here today to, to speak to us about this topic of synthesizing life. Uh, Juan began his career um, at the University of Sevilla in Spain. Um, then he went uh, for a brief stint at the University of Barcelona before uh, getting his master's degree in mathematics and physics at Trinity College, or Trinity, Trinity College to be in Dublin. Uh, not content with that, he then uh, obtained a Fulbright to return uh, to, to move to the United States, uh, where he uh, enrolled at the City College of New York and where he got his PhD. Um, from there, he went to uh, Louisiana State University for a professorship, um, but was only there a couple and a half years because he missed Spain, his native Spain, and returned back home, uh, where he uh, worked there for the Spanish National Research Council for many years, um, acquiring um, affiliations with Los Alamos uh, National Labs uh, along the way. And then uh, in 1998, he uh, was uh, instrumental in the foundation of the uh, Centro de Astrobiología in Madrid, um, and he has been, was there for many years before uh, now, before moving to Harvard in 2010 as a senior research fellow. So hopefully I got that approximately right, Juan. I apologize if I missed anything or got things out of the way. All right, thumbs up is great. Uh, so uh, today he's going to be telling us about um, his research on uh, synthesizing life. And uh, as I said in the chat room, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, to, if you have any questions, to please hold them until the end, and then I will read them to Juan at the end of the uh, at the end of the hour. So uh, with that, I'm going to mute myself and uh, stop my video. And I hope all of you do the same so that we have enough bandwidth uh, to see all of the great slides and videos that Juan is going to be presenting today. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Juan for uh, today's presentation. Hello, Rory. Hello, everybody. I am talking to you from Arlington near uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Arlington is where my house is. And uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking at this uh, colloquium on astrobiology, uh, 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 celebrated by the Astrobiology Group at the uh, University of uh, Washington in Seattle. So today I will be talking about what you see in the title, uh, Synthesizing Non-Biochemical Life Mimics, copying what life does using, uh, uh, not using biochemistry. I will discuss a little bit the principles, the experiments, and hopefully the consequences. So I'll be talking till about five or 10 to, till seven, so uh, that you can ask questions. And uh, if you had more uh, questions uh, that you think you wanna send me an email or something, you can send me an email. You can find me at the Harvard uh, website. You can find my email. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to start with a, a little introduction. This is a transparency where you see the history of life. It's a succinct uh, presentation of uh, uh, how life uh, is started on Earth about th uh, four billion years ago. And uh, you, on top of it, you have the origin of the solar system and the planets. And then it goes all the way back to the Big Bang. So this is the evolution of the universe and the evolution of life. Today I will be not be talking about details of geology or uh, biology or anything like that. I will be talking about uh, the view that a physicist uh, has, like me, has of life and how um, he uh, tries to copy life to see if we can uh, bring further our knowledge of how life appeared here or how life can be made and give us uh, some notion as to what life could be in other places in the universe, which is one of the main missions of astrobiology. So this uh, life in our planet, we are right here today. We are creating instruments to go and understand where we are. And, uh, but before us, many other things have happened in the planet. And we are today with a vision of the evolution of life, which starts with some a last a universal common ancestor. And out of this, it, uh, there is branches into the uh, domains of bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. 
Uh, this is not my transparency, it's the transparency of a very esteemed friend and colleague of myself, uh, Andy, Professor Andrew No. And the reason why I put it here is because this is Luca, right here is the last universal common ancestor, which presumably had DNA and all that, but we ask, whence did it come from? What happened? How did it come here? Uh, did any protocells or uh, some other simpler form of things that approximated the life we know today uh, evolved before? So what I will be talking about here is like an engineering physics view of what might be happening here. And it will be uh, not only mathematical and modeling uh, of, the, of the physics, but it will also be accompanied by chemistry experiments done in our laboratories. So as we all know, all life is uh, based on a limited uh, number of basic components. And a, a very important feature about life and its components is that their assembly, the assembly of these components is controlled by uh, information carried in the form of chemistry or handled by chemistry. But it's not simple, life is extremely complex as we know perhaps is, what is the most complex phenomenon that we know nowadays. And even the simplest form of life, the simplest form of life, like a bacterium, like a, for example, Escherichia coli, which is about three microns from, the, from here to here, half a micron from here to here, is, re, is a really complicated mix of molecules and uh, arrangements of molecules, and even in the form of small turbines, rotors, that actually move the flagella. So even a simple bacterium is enormously complex. So we ask the question, can we explain this complexity? What can we do about understanding this complexity? And we point out a few things. The first thing we point out is that all the above is based, all the biology we know is based on and uses standard physical chemical processes. But there is a huge leap in the complexity from regular chemistry to biochemistry, the chemistry of uh, chemicals which are particularly involved in, in life and even to the assembly of those chemicals into a living system. There is a widely held and very useful because it's been checked many times tenet in fundamental physics which is the complexity that we see at the surface of a phenomenon is perhaps a reflection of a very deep simplicity and in fact this uh, line of thinking we have used in physics to understand for example the origin of the universe or to approximate a, a, the understanding of the origin of the universe where we understand a, a fair amount of detail because we understand what we see in terms of theories and predictions that these theories make. We understand from the Big Bang about 13.7 billion years ago to today. We understand, we don't understand all the details, but we understand a lot of what went on in between and to the point where we can actually pack all that information or a lot of that information about the universe. We can pack it in a number of simp relatively simple equations, a few equations. We can put them in a computer and we can, when we put them in a computer, we can uh, uh, simulate how the universe would, uh, would evolve. Let me see if, I, if I, uh, there is a trick here, which I need to use. Uh, we can put it in a computer, solve those equations in a computer. And we see that our equations predict the evolution of the universe from a random mixture of materials into structures like that, which we can then compare this here, can then be compared with observations that we make of the universe, like for example, measurements of the galaxies and classes of galaxy that we see uh, using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you see that they correspond, there is a correspondence uh, between what the theory predicts and what we observe. So can we do this for life? Well, there are difficulties, many difficulties, of course. One of them is that we only know a type of uh, life on Earth. It's the only life that we know. We don't know, we suspect that there exists life in many places in the universe, but we don't know uh, if that's the case. We, uh, we hope and we suspect, but we don't know and we will not know until we detect it directly there. And another difficulty that there is, is that uh, there is no unified mathematical description using physical chemical principles of the basic principles of life. 
And since that is not available, as a contrary to what was the case in gravitation and cosmology, uh, which we had Einstein's equations, so uh, we cannot make too much, too many predictions either, based on the typical method that's used in physics and in uh, fundamental physics in general. Another problem is that we cannot modify the carbon atom, which is in central to life. We cannot modify its quantum mechanics even a little bit, because simply quantum mechanics doesn't allow us to modify it. And if we were able to modify it and change it in such that they, they produced a little change in, in life, we could somehow uh, link those changes in life uh, 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 made by changing, this is impossible, but by changing the carbon atom a little bit, we would see how they reflected in life and then we could infer uh, many things about biology. And finally, there is a very important point, which is that today still, Biology is a position described, uh, it's a process described science, which means that we describe biological processes without really having the need or the interest uh, because it's, it's extremely complex already as it is uh, of describing from first principles. So what can we do about that? Can we do something about it? Well, we can. And uh, if we are able to do something, then maybe we will be able to uh, give answers to questions like, uh, are there many other more types of lives? Perhaps lives, many lives, many different types. Are all lives uh, uh, based on biochemistry? And the first question we need to, uh, uh, to uh, the first step we have to take in order to, uh, uh, in my view, in order to uh, 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 go into such a description is to produce a general mathematical, logical mathematical description of life. Is it possible using the power that physics and mathematics offer you in order to unify concepts? The answer will be that uh, there is an attempt that we've made, which, is, uh, which has a lot of power. And then can one use that mathematical description to use uh, using the approach of the scientific method in physics? Can we use it to make some form of life in the laboratory? So at this point, all we have is natural life on earth which, as we know, it exists and adapts in many different environments in our planet. And from that, we hope to be able to understand how, if it was biochemistry-based, how it would uh, evolve or exist in other realms of the universe. But if we had a mathematical theory, maybe we can predict new things, we, can, we could understand new things about life. So this is a brief motivation for the introduction to our talk. And uh, this is the introduction I just finished. So uh, we will be talking about some theory and some cool things these theories predict. Uh, the theory is a, a simply a physical, a chemical, mathematical theory. I will explain it in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Then we will talk about some theory directed experiments. That is to say, experiments that the theory suggests you could do using synthetic chemistry, but non-biochemical polymer chemistry. We will describe some uh, 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 very interesting type of phenom uh, type of chemistry uh, um, uh, of polymers, which is called polymerization induced cell assembly. You will see what it is, and it's it's uh, generating systems which are capable of self assembling and be functional systems uh, with chemistry which has nothing to do with biochemistry. And then we will show how we are building a totally synthetic, non biochemical a protocell style supramolecular object in the tens of microns in size range and what it does. And you will see it with your own eyes what they do. And then I end up with some conclusions uh, uh, of the talk. So this is what we will cover today. And uh, we will now uh, go deeply into the talk. And first of all, let's think of our friend uh, Erwin Schrodinger. Erwin Schrodinger spend many time, uh, spend a uh, time thinking and uh, writing about uh, um, the physics of biology. And he wrote a, an extremely influential book, which is What is Life? People have tried to uh, define life and debated about that forever. They came up with, people have come up with schemes, uh, define, trying to define life or to characterize life and so on. I'm not gonna do that. What I'm going to do is, uh, think a little bit like uh, probably the Wright brothers or somebody like that thought they want to make a bird. So um, we're not going to copy the wings and the feathers and all that. 
So with, uh, the Wright brothers in particular used Ben Willis principle and the internal combustion engine to actually enable, put a, make a, build a machine that would actually have the function of flight. So that's how our airplanes were built. So following that line of thinking in which you try and go to the most fundamental features of a system, uh, here are a collection of four of them, which are hierarchically expressed, which most people would uh, uh, agree that they characterize living systems. All living systems handle information. They handle information uh, using chemistry. Uh, with that information, they, uh, the systems make parts, they, uh, they manage energy, but they also make parts that will eventually be used for making their children and uh, they will also self-replicate some, uh, some molecules which are contained, uh, which are used within them, and then they will self-replicate uh, and self-reproduce in, in a way which is programmed and controlled through metabolism and the information which is in the system. Finally, the system, the living system, will uh, uh, evolve, in other words, will change and ad a, a, in adaptation to changes in the environment or if it will, it will also change, not necessarily based on adaptation, but also change in various ways, like for example, mutations, uh, which are induced by a cosmic ray, for example. So uh, uh, the two forms of evolution, adaptive and non-adaptive evolution. These four properties form a hierarchy and that hierarchy of properties we see in all living systems. In living systems, we see the genome uh, with the information, metabolism is uh, usually uh, uh, thought of in terms of the, the network of uh, uh, metabolic reactions that take place, the metabolic pathways that take place many times in uh, our, uh, our living systems. We uh, uh, think of systems in uh, of living systems in terms of the programmed self-assembly, not thermodynamic self-assembly, like the drops of uh, uh, water that fall on a leaf and then they self-assemble into a bigger drop, more stable drop. Living systems do program self-assembly as we see here for these uh, animals, these insects in, in, the, in the picture there. And finally, we do see the systems evolving, like for example, Darwin's finches or something like that. So uh, people have come to the notion, in particular, uh, there, is a, there was a very influential, not, uh, extremely influential, but influential group uh, or, uh, thinking about systems in life, living systems in the 1970s, uh, Miller, who began to try and put together a notion that uh, living systems consist of three different types of systems. Systems that uh, process matter and energy, systems that process information, and systems that process both matter, energy, and information. With those three, uh, these three systems or these three types of systems in interaction, you make a living system. This is a, 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 a small uh, mm, uh, representation of a, a bacterium. Uh, and uh, there are macromolecules there that are organized into the various living system, uh, various subsystems. There is crowding in there. The, mo the molecules are terribly crowded here. The reaction rates are not what you see in vitro and so on and so forth. And living systems replicate by first beginning to grow in mass until they reach a, twice the size of the mass. And then they change the, the amount of information that they contain by increasing the, replicating the DNA they have. In a particular way, they reach a stable uh, size. Then there is a chromosome segregation. And after a little bit, when the uh, mass has reached twice the size, the system replicates and so on and so forth. Can you imitate all of this? How do you represent this, all these four properties? How do you represent those four properties using some mathematical equations? Would you need a ton of equations? Would you have enough if you had five or 10 or eight, or is it necessary to have 10 million equations, as many as chemical reactions are going on in a very simple living system? The answer is no. You could represent those four, uh, those four uh, basic properties uh, with an eye, with an eye into use, uh, uh, interpret, expressing those properties with chemistry, not necessarily biochemistry, by uh, thinking in terms of the way in fundamental physics we approach problems. So we want to have 
uh, eventually we will want to have a chemistry, so we need a mechanism to react and another one to transport molecules. For example, we will need to have a diffusion to, for transporting molecules and reaction for the collection of the for collisions of the molecules to occur and to react. The simplest, simplest system, living system or whatever, uh, like a living system, would need to have at least two components. Seen from very far away, it would look like two components. A, a, a component which is the living system itself, like some form of meta uh, uh, chemical species, that is to say chemical species, which is not a, a, a just a pure chemical species, but probably as you go into deeper and deeper detail, you begin to disentangle that is actually made by many others, but you would need a, a species which would be representing like the cell and another one which would be representing like the food you would need to place the system in an environment, an environment which is in principle a random environment, an environment in which sometimes there is food, sometimes there is no food, or uh, sometimes there are people who are coming and try, trying to eat you and so on and so forth. So this is a form of noise in the system. A random component can be represented as a form of noise in the sense it is used in the technical disciplines. Uh, the, the noise can be inside because there are chemical reactions which are noisy to each, produce, uh, generate noise to each to others nearby, or it could be in the environment. Like for example, there could be a storm, or uh, there could be a, a drought, or something like that. So each of the, so these are basic uh, uh, components for this such a set of equations, and those equations would need to model somehow the the, uh, the handling of information. For that, you would need that they uh, the that they be that they enter. This, uh, the reaction part of the equation as linear components or as quadratic components or in a, a quadratic form, which is the product of those two. If you want to have metabolism, you would need to have autocatalysis. And for that, you need to know that the time evolution or the rate of uh, that particular species would have to be proportional to itself or again, to the product of itself with the others. So you would need to have a quadratic term in U or a quadratic term in V or in U and V. In order to have self-replication, you need to have a system which is actually capable of producing copies of it. It was discovered by no, uh, no less than Alan Turing in the early 1950s. He discovered that uh, systems where you have cubic interactions, interaction terms, like such as V to the cube or V or U to the cube or U V squared do have what are called Turing patterns, which is the formation of aggregates that evolve. That's a very important uh, uh, question for living systems. And finally, you will, in order to have evolution, you will need to have feedback loops, which uh, uh, operate in that, uh, in, in, in that random medium. Having said that, then you uh, can begin to think of a system in which the, you say, okay, so what would be such an ideal system? What would be required? And that is represented schematically here in, in this uh, transparency, which is a minimal model that incorporates the four properties that I mentioned earlier. It is, uh, imagine that you have like a, some sort of membrane for separating the inner of the living system from the outside. In the outside, there is food, which is fed into the system. And then the system processes the food and the system itself uh, reprocesses and produces some uh, waste and the waste is thrown away and then it's receiving noise and energy from the outside. This is a, a, can be represented by this particular kinetics. You can look at a paper uh, in physical review letters in 2003 by myself and three other wonderful collaborators. Now I'm putting a new version of the same together with another wonderful collaborator, Fredo Perez, uh, Professor Fredo Perez Munusturi from a uh, University of Santiago and also an associate at Harvard University. And you can write down the kinetic equations for this, uh, for this uh, type of situation where you have the cubic term, the linear term, a noise term for the source of U, a diffusion term so that it diffuses, like uh, for example, a liquid that diffuses or a liquid that diffuses and reacts or a gas that diffuses and reacts. And these uh, three equations are the three equations that are predicted by the spherical cow, the simplest possible, most uh, elementary uh, model that you could conceive 
uh, uh, as represent mathematical model that you could conceive as jointly in a unified way representing the four properties that characterize a living system. So once you have those equations, you can put them in a computer. And even if you put them without the last equation, as we did uh, in the early 2000s, you put the equations, these are the form of the equations, and you put an instance of a particular instance of noise and a particular value of the constants in these equations. You put them in a computer and the red thing is the foot, the blue thing is one instance of the equations, which have the ability to uh, uh, propagate. And here is what happens. This is a computer simulation. So you see that it generates a pattern. Those two equations, not even the three equations, with the three, it's even more interesting. That fills the space. That doesn't look very much like a living system. So you could change the parameters, same equations, same noise, different parameters. Oops, excuse me. You put the, that in a computer. I need that this. Well, I chose, okay, so you have different situations, completely different situations. This one is, a, 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 it makes like a, a, a color of pearls or you can have a situation such as this, which looks like a colony of bacteria that actually replicate. And if you measure the properties of those uh, 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 objects that you see oscillating and, and evolving in, the, in your screen, then you can uh, begin to see that they actually, uh, you can measure the mass, you can measure the entropy, and the negative of the entropy is information. Then you could see that there, they describe something similar to the cell division cycle represented here. So let me show in this, those solutions now with the new, uh, instead of the old, the, the old two equations, just to show you in more detail how they replicate. Let me uh, use, show to you what happens when you have three, uh, three substances, including the waste. And here you have how the system self-replicates. So a very simple set of equations describes some very important properties of life. You can look at it in much more detail and you can start uh, by uh, making the system uh, evolve and studying how, in this case, the, uh, mm, uh, it, the, the mass of the system is going to evolve and how the information in the system is going to evolve. And you start, uh, as the system begins to replicate, the system starts like this. Then uh, this is at 80 time units. In 200 time units, it will be elongated, a little bit elongated. The system does it by itself. The, uh, in, the, in this curve here, you see that the uh, uh, information is, is it, sorry, the mass is changing a little bit. And the entropy of the system is changing in a way which is a, approximating what the cell division cycle does for a natural living system. So these equations in some way a, a include many of the, a, a can represent many of the basic features of a living system. They lead to self-replication. They, they a, have a information that evolves, changes, and so on. You can also show that they are adaptive. And so they represent the four properties. But this is mathematics. It's not chemistry. It's not anything that we see alive. These are computer simulations. So can you transform these computer simulations into something which is uh, more than just mathematics, uh, some chemistry? Well, uh, we ask ourselves this, that question. That is a question that has been asked by all the people who thought about writing equations for how a living system works. In particular, in the 1970s, a, 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 an extraordinary Hungarian by name Ganti, Tibor Ganti, put forward the notion of a chemoton in which he put together a number of equations that did some of the things that, I, 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 uh, that I've shown you, to you before. The, his equations are not free, they're very complicated, they're not, they, he tries to emulate actual life. He wasn't thinking about something which is more abstract. 
And, but this is a very inspiring idea, which has been, of course, uh, highlighted by uh, John Sutherland recently when he's trying to, uh, in, in papers where he's trying to try and explain the origin of life from HCN out of the blue. HCN is a, a, a ferricyanide is blue and plays a very important role in this theory. So in his theory. So, uh, but he was definitely inspired by the simplicity of uh, uh, Ganti's ideas of having a membrane and nutrients and then some waste and then a genome uh, which carries the information and the autocatalysis inside. Well, that's what our equations do also. So, uh, but is it possible to give some high level, uh, that is little detail, uh, chemical uh, kinetics uh, that would represent our equations? Uh, can we find such a, such a kinetics? Well, the answer of course is yes, okay? And as I've shown to you in, in, in the previous uh, transparencies, it is possible to give a very high level, little detail, chemical kinetics, kinetics based mathematical representation to each of the four plus one, meaning chemistry properties of life. We have that these properties can be represented by a small set of three reaction diffusion equations and the soft in a computer, the solutions so the show the essential uh, properties of a living system, such as self-replication, adaptation, and a, gen a very generic form of the cell division uh, cycle. So this is very encouraging, but what is the chemistry? Well, let's uh, follow a, a, a very well-known painter, uh, Pablo Picasso, and say that everything, he's, he used to say that everything you can imagine is real, to which I would add, depend on how many uh, uh, cigarettes or uh, drinks have you had before, you said it, but everything you can imagine with the help of the scientific method, that's me now, uh, uh, you could in principle begin to feel that it is real or have some notion that it could be real if you've done this, uh, the physics in this case correctly. So surprisingly, the equations that we see are actually, the equations that I wrote down for you earlier are actually the equations for the kinetic of a very famous chemical reaction. We didn't know that this was the case when we wrote the equations. And these equations are a model for the kinetics of the Belusov Sabotinsky, more about it in a, in a minute, Belusov Sabotinsky oscillatory chemical reaction, which is a redox uh, chemical reaction. BC, which is how I will call a, a, a Belusov Sabotinsky from now on, BC has nonlinear oscillations and produces radicals chemical radicals. These two points are very important. The fact that it produces nonlinear oscillations will have to do with the fact that you can build a chemical automaton based on the BC chemical reaction, which is capable of behaving like the most advanced automaton in computer uh, theory, which is a Turing machine, the same Turing that, was, that uh, did the Turing instability. He did the Turing machine in the 1930s. And it, that's another very, very, very important chapter in, in science. So BC is capable of, or produces redox oscillations, which are nonlinear. And, and that's important for the information part of the e equations. And when you make them into chemistry. And in addition, BC produces radicals, which we will see in the next few transparencies, we will see are fundamental to actually generate polymerization and generate like a vesicle, which is what would provide you with a, a, the vesicle, the formation of a vesicle will provide you with a gradient of free energy between the inside of the vesicle and the outside, and therefore provide the environment in which concentrations are different in, uh, in the inside than the outside. And that will pro provide through the intervention of physical chemistry will provide uh, what you need, which is a, a gradient of free energy to actually run the system. So a, a, can we construct such a system? And the answer is yes. And a, a, how, do we, how do we do it? Well, a, we will use the guidance provided by the equations and a, we will first of all a, gen, try and generate a, using the, the VC reaction later, but at first we will try and generate a vesicle from a homogeneous mixture. That is to say, we will try and generate from chemistry alone some structure which is capable of containing other, uh, other material in the inside 
and the evolution of the other material in the inside combined with the evolution in the material on the outside will generate a system that is actually capable of doing things. And uh, that we call the uh, starting of such a system to do its functions, we call that boot up, just like uh, you do in computers. When you start a computer from just power and the structure of the computer, you boot up the system. So uh, I will show you how you can boot up a system using chemistry. And uh, mm, uh, there is a, a, a extant cells give you an idea of how to do that. Y you need to establish a gradient of free energy between the outside and the inside. You need to uh, have some chemistry in the inside that produces the, uh, uh, some membrane to guard or to keep that gradient of free energy. And you need to, that, in that way, you, need to con you can concentrate chemicals inside which will act at the right, the correct reaction rate so as to have the system operating. And when the, uh, uh, the whole system is working in concert, then the system will actually be able to do to uh, manipulate this free energy gradient. In living systems, all this metabolism part is done through the, uh, uh, the network of metabolic pathways that we're familiar with. And what we're gonna be doing in the next transparencies is the equivalent with polymers of this part of the metabolism. This is roughly, it's not exactly that. For in order to do that, what we are going to do is start in order to provide the generation for, or this of this particular, uh, 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 how, what you might call this, of this particular membrane vesicle, we need to, uh, we will start with a, a, a uniform material in a vial here. This uniform material contains some things which I will explain to you in, 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 in a couple of transparencies. And those materials will actually begin, this is homogeneous here, there will be lights shining on this. Then as time passes, this indicates hours. As time passes, the system at first doesn't feel much change. Then it begins to change. And when it is for this particular mixture, it begin, uh, it begin, the, the system begins to be turbid at about three to four hours. At six hours, it's already turbid. And uh, you will see what it leads to after uh, uh, six, seven, and eight hours. So let's, having said all of that, let's go back to the previous transparency. And we're gonna go from here using the equivalent of this, which is some polymerization reaction. We're going to generate a system which is actually capable of uh, doing all of those. For that, you need a special type of polymerization. In order to make a vesicle, you need a, a, a molecules which are amphiphiles. The amphiphiles are molecules which contain a head that likes water and a tail that doesn't like water it, it, if it is in water. So a, a head which is a, a soluble for the solvent, solvophilic and a tail which is solvophobic. So a, in order, to, you can do that, but if you want to make vesicles which are more or less of the same size, you need to have the hydrophobic chain and the hydrophilic chain to be more or less constant. So starting with a, a, a hydrophilic, a, for example, head, you could, use a method which is called raft, reversible addition, fragmentation, chain transfer, and actually make a polymer whose length is more or less constant. Uh, this is raft polymerization, has this particular property. With other polymers, you would make a, the a hydrophobic tail, you would make it a, of many a different lengths, and the systems would not assemble into anything productive. Uh, one such system is represented here, this is a, a, a system of a molecule here, a, the hydrophilic molecule. It's a, a polyethylene glycol. Uh, we say 43 units. And then uh, there are monomers in the solution. That's what that would be in, in, the, in, in this vial here, the monomers in the solution. And then you begin, you shine light. It's photochemistry as the, you shine light the photochemistry begins to attach these monomers, begin to attach them here, and the amphiphile be chain begins to grow. As it begins to grow, uh, these two be, uh, uh, enter into a situation where they're not stable as uh, isolated molecules, and they begin to associate and they self-organize first into a flat, uh, excuse me, into something which is called a micelle, 
which is like a, a sphere, smaller sphere. And then if it keeps growing, then it will change morphology. And for example, you could see in this uh, pictures uh, taken from a paper by uh, Jan Szymanski and myself, published in Polymer Chemistry in 2016. You will see that out of a blob of polymer, there is a polymer, this is taking 50, the picture on the left is taking 15 minutes before the picture on the right, a polymer that begins to grow. And as it, gr as it grows with a, with a chemical reaction, it begins to change the structure inside. So you see that this is a vesicle. It has here each of these uh, uh, notches represents six microns. So this is about eight microns here. And this is about 12 microns here. So you see how it grows in 15 minutes. So this is a vesicle which is in the making and uh, in using this raft polymerization and using a process which is called PISA for polymerization induced self-assembly. It's a very nice name. And here you have in more details a little bit of how it works. Let me see if I am able to, I, I just had a glitch in the, in the slide. So you start with a, a, a hydrophilic a head, you add, a, it, which has attached to it, a, something which is called a macro, a, this is the micro, the hydrophilic head, chain transfer agent, and then there are monomers around, this is the uh, solution. Then you shine light, and the a shining of the light produces the polymerization of these monomers onto this a, a hydrophilic a tail. And what happens is what you see there. So there is the hydrophilic head, the hydrophobic tail, and there is a chain transfer agent which stays at the end of the hydrophobic tail. And this is the, the membrane, the vesicle membrane that has formed. Uh, the, these vesicles, uh, the, the shapes they take, they it can be of various types. It can be in, in the form of a, a, um, vesicles as you see here, but it could also be uh, something which are called worms. So first you make micelles, then you make worms, then you make vesicles as the polymerization keeps making the chain of a BC of the of the amph uh, uh, of the hydrophobic tail. You make it uh, longer and longer, so you end up making vesicles. So these vesicles can be filled, uh, can be done with light, as I mentioned. They can also be made with radicals, as the one produced by BC chemistry, and uh, the, uh, the apparatus that it takes to make it is a it's a fairly simple. If you have interest, you can check a, a paper by us in, in scientific reports in 2017. And what happens is if you do it with light only, you produce, as you see uh, here, the, uh, you start with the homogeneous mixture. The homogeneous mixture begins to uh, 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 react. Uh, reactions begin to take place there the chains grow, they self-assemble, and they produce objects, which you can see in this next transparency here. In this movie, this is a movie uh, taken at the microscope, and you can see, we have a better quality movie, you can see somebody coming out of here, which is growing. You will see that he collapses, and then he grows again. And when he collapses, more structures like him begin to appear near him. And that's because it, as if, it, as if they were spores, he it puts out some of the anus macro CTA molecules. And out of that, more uh, vesicles appear and reproduce. A vesicle can have many cycles. We call this phoenix behavior because it's like the phoenix uh, of mythology that it grew, it grew up again out of its own ashes. So that's essentially what it does. But not only does it uh, do that, it also, uh, the, the population changes. In other words, the system begins to self-replicate, self-reproduce, and you begin to see a lot of activities of interest in the vesicle. You see also that the vesicles go towards the center. They have photo, uh, photochemical, photochemistry that actually uh, brings, the ves uh, brings the vesicles towards the light. It could also be thermochemistry, but it's thermal, uh, photochemistry in this case. And you see things uh, uh, in more quality than the, in the previous transparency. You see things like this. So here is somebody coming from Seattle, going to Oklahoma. So 
he is coming to the center. This is about 12 microns. He is growing in his first generation, collapses, grows again, more grow, and so on. And this is an emergent behavior which is was totally unexpected. So we now understand how this happens. And uh, uh, if you are interested, there is a review paper coming out by Sam Pierce and myself in polymer chemistry uh, describing how this happens. And I can give more details if you wish. You can also build with the, with the BC reaction, I said, you could build something like a, 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 a computer and the BC reaction produces radicals. The radicals that are produced by a, the BC reaction can actually uh, take monomeric units. And this is the BC reaction. You, uh, the ruthenium uh, goes from reduced to oxidized and produces CO2 and H2O. Peluso produced, uh, generated this reaction with the, notion, with the idea that it would represent a form of uh, artificial metabolism as if it were. And then you, this is how you start. This is how you end the reaction. And here you go. As the, the, uh, the oscillations in the reaction take place, here they produce, this is the hydrophilic tail. This is the trans chain transfer agent. The, the red balls are the monomers of the, um, uh, which will make a hydrophobic tail. So the uh, uh, radicals producing the reaction uh, generate the, uh, or the attachment, the polymerization of the monomers onto the hydrophilic uh, head. And it will grow and grow and grow and eventually make a vesicle. And this is the way this would look like after uh, 20 minutes to an hour. So it's a fairly quick uh, uh, process. This, when you look at them in more detail, and I will show you a couple of pictures, when you look at them in more detail, you will see that they uh, have really interesting uh, uh, details. Uh, this, is, uh, this was published in Angevante Chemie in 2017, and uh, it was the cover for that section. Here you have what I just described to you. And here is the reaction in the laboratory. The sound you hear is the noise of the agitator and the air conditioning in the laboratory. And you will see in a few seconds, you will see how this reaction changes, the color changes to clear, which is the oscillation. So right now it's reduced. It's around here, it's reduced. And it will change very quickly to clear, which is uh, the oxidized state. It reaches the oxidized state. Another part of the uh, uh, polymerization reaction takes place, and then it will go slowly into the uh, reduced state, and so on and so forth. Somebody, not us, somebody said who understood the paper and knew that we could build a chemical Turing machine using the BC reaction said a primitive chemical robot makes molecules and uses them to construct its own molecular container. That's perfect. It's actually true. The oscillation. Uh, takes place, uh, it controls the polymer, it's like a computer, controls the polymerization, leads to self-assembly and self-encapsulation of the system. And when you, instead of doing it with light, you do it this way, you, uh, and you study uh, the, uh, with, uh, um, with uh, uh, electron microscopy, what happens, you do see some form of mitosis instead of replication in the form of uh, spores that we have spoken about earlier. So you starting with simple chemistry and uh, using these equations, you're able to be guided into systems which are capable of self-replicating, cap systems which are first capable of self-assembling, self-replicating, controlling the self-replication. You can program the chemical computer or the chemical Turing machine can be programmed. And it's a system that is capable of uh, somehow controlling its past, except that the system will actually be able to replicate one or two times. We have so far discovered two pathways. One pathway is, this is this represents PISA. One pathway is through spores, and the other pathway is through methodic uh, replication, as you have here with this, uh, with, this is of course a drawing. 
and uh, the oscillations do not really correspond to chemical oscillations. This is more like a, a different type of oscillation. But this is like methodic replication. This is a possible pathway. And this is the other pathway where you have exponential growth, which is by spores. And with that, you can actually begin to see a pathway to start with the chemistry. chemistry. And from the chemistry, excuse me, the ideas, the notion, the equations, for that, from that you construct a chemical system that you can actually build in the laboratory and implement this paradigm of a system which is capable of handling all four uh, properties of a living system. Uh, uh, jokingly, of course, and with all uh, respect to biology, of course, we can think of our system as making, making coffee with a, a, a chemix, and we can think of a real bacterium as a very complicated system capable of doing many more things and much more perfectly and much better. This is the cover of, a new, of the New York in November. I think it, it is a 2017 or something like that. And so you get coffee, the functions of life, as you get here, except here is much simpler and you don't have so many controls as you have there. We have a pathway in which we are able to, uh, inspired by uh, the basics of biology, we are able to uh, 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 represent all four reactions, all four properties of life in terms of some chemi uh, chem uh, chemical kinetics. We are able to implement that chemical kinetics into a, a system which is capable of self-booting and self-replicating and doing the function of life. We some ba very basic functions of life. We have also built systems which are actually, uh, they have two different uh, uh, um, uh, 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 catalysts and one of them, and one is more adept to a, a particular type of light than the other. And so they, it's, it, they are the same type of uh, living, living, living systems. We call them bichos, which in Spanish means bugs. And, uh, and in English is the acronym for biologically inspired, chemically operated synthetic systems. And then it, the, in, some, in some metaphorical sense, these systems select themselves just like a, the, the a, a finches select themselves in, in depending on the weather and the conditions they select, a, the populations are selected in terms of their ability to survive. And in fact, we're doing some experiments. These uh, are exper uh, experiments with Sai uh, Katla and Chen Yulin in my laboratory, which we are preparing for publication now and where we see the behavior of this, uh, the behavior of uh, several of these uh, uh, meta species, one with a, a zinc catalyst and the other one with a zinc catalyst. And we see that the behavior parallels the behavior that was found by Gauss in the 1930s for Paramecia fighting with each other. So we wonder what uh, this is telling us. This is telling us that you can uh, mm, concoct some kind of chemistry or put together some kind of chemistry which is not biochemistry which can be summarized at, with a very little amount of detail can be summarized in a small set of three equations that unify all the basic properties of life as we know it today on planet earth if we solve these equations in a computer we show that they have the solutions display the phenomenology of a generic living system with those, we can design a, an active synthetic a polymer vesicles, which self-reproduce by spores. They, when they collapse, we understand how the collapse happens because of hydrodynamics and osmotic forces and so on. We understand that in fairly, a, a fairly good amount of detail. They, and then they release molecules, which again can react with the environment and they make their own vesicles again. And those, uh, we call those uh, spores in some way, these degraded chemicals, and then solve a chicken and egg problem. That is to say, how do you start the system? Well, the system starts with a homogeneous material which can chemically react and then produce isolated uh, system. The system is an out of, non, it's out of equilibrium system. We have developed, I didn't explain this because time is of the essence and I just didn't have time. Uh, we have developed a chemical computer, a chemical tuning machine that actually is able to do also this uh, polymerization process and synthesizes its own enclosure and boots up a program system which is self-replicating. What it boots depends on how you make, uh, you program the computer. 
and may also be self-reproducing, definitely self-replicating, maybe self-reproducing like the previous one. We call these objects bichos, which in Spanish, which it stands for biologically inspired, chemically operated synthetic systems. In Spanish, a, a bicho with only one S means bug. So it, it's a nice acronym. We have put two varieties of bichos, different, different uh, uh, catalysts to compete for resources. And the one that's less fed is eaten by the others, which is uh, interesting, but also quite unsettling. Okay. And then finally, these synthetic systems illustrate how some basic features of the property, the functional properties of life and its behavior can work without using biochemistry. Biochemistry does it, of course, but this chemistry also does it, and it's a fairly simple chemistry. What does it tell us about protocells and the origin of life on Earth? Uh, we were thinking at the very opening of the talk, we were talking about what came before DNA, before RNA, RNA before life as we know it. So we're talking about probably something about here, very, very, very at the beginning. But of course, I don't think it was a, one of our beaches, but our beaches can tell you that there is possibilities that something much simpler occurred. And redox reactions are extremely common. And redox reactions produce a, 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 are capable of being used for computing and redox reactions can also be uh, used for polymerization in term, uh, because they produce radicals. This is all very important and very interesting in view of the huge variety of planetary systems that we're finding and how they classify, they organize themselves into gas giants and a, a variety of other rocky planets and so on and so forth. Maybe they can harbor many chemical species which uh, would organize themselves into uh, other forms of life. And if we went to one of those places and we saw something that did, uh, that did what I showed in the movie, uh, for example, in, 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 this, in, in this movie, if we saw that with the camera, we saw something that, that this, we would, would we say, oh, this is alive, or no, 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 this is a bicho, which is not truly alive. It's, uh, it doesn't use biochemistry. If you only look at the functions, this is what you're going to find. You're not going to be able to tell unless it is something much more complicated than this. But this is a, what, where this leaves us. It leaves us uh, thinking, at least me, thinking that life is probably a very common phenomenon in the universe. And it depends a lot. The nature of the life that we see in different places depends a lot on the conditions in other planetary environments. And with that, and a thanks to our sponsors, it's always good to thank the sponsors and the people that work with you on this. And there is a very long list of people that worked on this with me in the last 10 years, but the sponsors are here, Repsol, a Spanish company that believes in the future and in technology and in the connection between technology and basic science. Let's invent the future together. And my university, which believes in the future, it believes in health and he believes in, in many of the ideas that we represent. So thank you very much to you for devoting time to listening to this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, I'll clap for everybody since they're all muted uh, by, in, uh, intentionally. So um, yeah, uh, I do, before I get to uh, questions, I just wanna make sure everybody on the line knows that we have reached four o'clock here in Seattle. So if you have to get to your next Zoom meeting, um, you might want to do that, but hopefully you can stick around um, and we'll uh, have the question and answer session until either the audience is out of questions or Juan tells us he's had enough. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and get, get started with the questions. Um, if you do have one, um, please type it into the chat room while I'm, I'm asking the ones that have already been entered. All right. Are you ready, Juan? Yep. Okay. The first question is from Stuart Bartlett, who asks, uh, in the pursuit of unification, what are the criteria for the point at which we know we cannot unify any further? How might we know that we have reached a level of description that is irreducible? This is a top-down approach in which you look at very little detail. So this is not, so there are many other possibilities that I am sure that this is not the only solution 
to the question of which uh, to the question of which equations unify all these four properties. I'm sure that there are many other possible solutions, but this is one that works. So the door is open or the window is open to actually appeal to other chemistries that can be represented by similar uh, kinetics. The kinetics that you, rep that you see there for berusov sabotinsky is a particular a coarse graining of the kinetics of berusov sabotinsky And there are three chemical reactions essentially there. In the chemical in uh, berusov sabotinsky there are more than a hundred uh, elementary chemical reactions taking place. So this system per se doesn't tell you what uh, the level of detail is that you can approach. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Eric Abel, who asks, is there a qualitative difference between the 2D and 3D dynamics of these equations? Um, he entered this in during the talk, and I assume he's gonna mean the BZ equations, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But maybe you can start with trying, trying to answer the question he thinks he's asking. That's a wonderful, 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 wonderful question. Also, the previous one was also a very nice question. That's a very good question. Uh, the 2D, we, uh, the reason why uh, he's asking this question is because he knows that the uh, universality properties of systems depends on the dimensionality of this, in, in which the system operates. So that's the basis for the question, I think. And uh, what we've uh, idealized here is we have thought of the system as a section of a sphere, okay? but your question is legit and it needs to be pursued in more detail, okay? From the point of view of the kinetics, from the point of view of the uh, dimensionality of the structures. So we have assumed that it is a section of, a, of a spherical uh, um, kinetics. And the reason why we can assume that is because you can actually represent the energy, the total energy and various physical chemical properties of vesicles and other a self-assembled structures in two dimensions as if they were a three-dimensional object or as if it was a two-dimensional structure with rotational symmetry and that's what we have soon. All right, yeah, thanks Juan. Uh, all right, next up is a question from Alan Caswell who says, if I missed it I apologize, but what is the cause of the collapse of the vesicles in the PISA experiment? Uh, the, the, the vesicles there are, I suppose it's the one that uh, they are growing and they collapse. The vesicles there, they uh, collapse because of the following. When you, uh, uh, first a short mathematical description and then the meat, as if it were, okay? So if you study the evolution, the mathematical evolution of the Navier-Stokes, that is to say the hydrodynamic equations, for a bubble, you discover that the bubble exists because there is a balance between the internal pressure in the bubble and the outside pressure. If you have a bubble that grows, like for example, a bubble which is subject to convection or a bubble, a vesicle like this, let's think of it as if it was a bubble, it's not a bubble, it's a vesicle with molecules, a bubble too, but it's, it's very active. So the, it, as it grows because of polymerization, then what happens is that the system begins to, the equations of Navier-Stokes, which in this case, this particular case of a bubble is called the rayleigh plesset equations, they begin to grow and they reach a maximum size at which hydrodynamically, the pressure inside and the pressure outside are the same. And then the surface tension is not capable of, as it expands, it's not capable of maintaining the structure together. So what happens is that they open and collapse. And that is shown in the dynamics of these bubbles. And that's why you have, for example, cavitation. If you open your, uh, your water tap and there is a little bit of air inside, you will hear, <laughs> sorry for the uh, uh, unpleasant noise, but that sounds, it's, it's a form of cavitation. In this case, what happens is that the chemistry is letting the bubble grow or the vesicle grow as it grows. It doesn't produce enough, ten enough material to put it, to, uh, put it on the, on the membrane and then the membrane weakens. As it weakens, then it, it acquires a defect and there is a, a, if there is more concentration of liquid here, 
there's more, there is water that comes. And then the water that comes expands it more. And the hydrodynamics then, the Laplace pressure brings it and collapses it. And that's the explanation as to why it, uh, it collapses. I didn't explain it. Uh, I think your name was Ed, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Alan, uh, mm, uh, mm, I didn't explain it. I didn't mention it, but I love the question. And that's the answer. <laughs> Great, thanks. All right, next up is a question from Mike Wong, who says, thanks for the fascinating talk. Can you say a few more words about how redox reactions perform computational tasks in your experiments? Okay, I will say, thank you, Michael, for the question. That's a very nice question. And uh, I will buy you the coffee I said I would buy. <laughs> okay, it's a, uh, I had to skip it because it was too, uh, too much. Uh, the chemical reaction, but I will take the opportunity to explain, this is very interesting. And we were, uh, my collaborator, Marta Duenas and myself, we were really happy to see this happening in front of our eyes. And then uh, we got help also from uh, Daniel Case, a summer student in Harvard. So this is the chemical reaction, the Belusov sabotinsky chemical reaction, the redox potential goes like this, okay? And in the next transparency, I'll show you how it works. So this is the chemical kinetics. I'm not gonna pay attention to the chemical kinetics because otherwise we'll be here forever. But this, is, this reaction has two uh, ke chemicals, two um, substrates. One is bromate, right here, and the other one, which is an oxidant, as you know, and the other one is malonic acid, which is a, 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 an acid, a reductant, okay? Organic reductant. And then, you imagine that you put one chemical in this uh, burette and the other chemical in this burette. And we are going to, and this is the chemicals in the reaction. So we're going to, this is oxidized, excuse me, reduced right here. So we're gonna, and that corresponds to a low redox potential. So we're gonna put a drop of the oxidant there at T equals zero. Put that, boom, the redox potential goes up. And then you let it react, nothing happens. It doesn't oscillate because it doesn't have any reductant yet. But at T equals 600 seconds, you put a drop of the, a, a, of the a reductant here. And then it begins to oscillate and it begins to do this. With a particular period, which depends on the amount of this and the amount of this. If you add another one of these, then there is a shift in the average value of the amplitude and a shift in the uh, in, the, in the frequency, which in, increases and so on. When each time that there is an oscillation, a radical, a type of radical is uh, produced here and a different type of radical is produced there. Those radicals we have identified and those radicals in, in the oscillations interact with the monomer. And when they interact with the monomer, they lead to the polymerization. We can control how this operates by building, by a, um, building sequences of chemicals that are fed to the reaction. And we, in this way, we are able to program how much is produced of each in the oscillations. When the oscillations take place, then the radicals, as I showed earlier in, 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 in the uh, talk, the radicals that are produced attach and begin the, the initiation of the of the polymerization at the radicals attach at the macro CTA, and then the macro CTA is a, a, a leaves space for the a, a monomer to attach to polymerize on top of the of this a, end of the hydrophobic a, hydrophilic a, a chain, and then when that happens, and and the, there is another. A, a um, radical that is emitted stops the polymerization and then there is a chance that it begins to add more and more uh, monomeric units and that's how it works and we can control how it works by controlling the properties of the malonic the amount of malonic acid we put the sodium bromate and the sequence in which we feed it to the reaction so that's how it works uh, uh, and if you are interested you can take a look at a, a, a this paper, 
but you could, uh, there is, all, this is from 2017. There are other papers you can look at our website and you can see papers on, uh, on making vesicles using the various uh, stages of the Turing machine. Now we are writing something on how to actually program the chemistry. I hope this rather, rather longish answer uh, replies to your question, Mark. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, our next question is from David Catling, who says, the PISA experiment used HPMA and MI rather than a simple carboxylic acid as, and used blue light rather than just ordinary visible light. Are these things important for getting PISA to work and how realistic are these for the prebiotic environment? That's a good question, David. <laughs> and a, a, a question we've been discussing in the initiative, in the Origins of Life initiative, where your name, with name, your name comes up often uh, today. Uh, it was mentioned quite a few times. It, the, this is an experiment which is, uh, thank you for the question. This is an experiment which, what you've seen, tries to avoid any biochemistry by design, okay? This is an experiment trying to show how the principle works. And this is, it uses blue light. Uh, you can use also green light if you want. It depends on the catalyst that you choose, the macro CTA agent, and so on and so forth. It's very general in the PISA. It could work in, and we are thinking about uh, trying to do a version of PISA with the synthesis that uh, Sutherland and company, a uh, type of synthesis that Sutherland and company are making for uh, the, uh, the lipids and this, their vesicles. I think it would work with uh, that there is a path to do it. I don't know the details and I don't know enough chemistry to be able to uh, find out the details, but I'm very willing to think about it because I think it's fascinating to understand uh, to if a pathway for PISA in uh, the, the, the uh, Sutherland synthesis world uh, exists because it would resolve a huge problem, the problem of the arithmetic demon. The arithmetic demon is a demon that was identified many years ago. I didn't know that it was identified by, a, among others, a colleague of mine in Spain's National Research Council. He was also a professor there and his name was Serratosa. And he was a few offices down from mine. I never spoke about this with him. This is about 40 years ago. And, but a, the a arithmetic demon it's a demon that says that uh, you lose, if you have very low concentration, you cannot have the chemistry, go, uh, the, the chemical synthesis going very easily because you cannot uh, purify, you cannot concentrate enough and so on and so forth. And the, uh, the, presence, of a, the presence of a vesicle that actually in, uh, is capable of encapsulating some important aspects of the chemistry is a huge step to solve the concentration problem and A and B, it's a huge step to also enable other pathways that would happening, would be new chemical pathways that would happen in the concentrated vesicle where you now have crowding and the chemical reactions, some chemical reactions are more selected than others. So that's the answer. Great, thanks. All right, and the final question comes from Mickey who asks, when you suggested life may be quite common throughout the universe, did you mean to imply simple life or multicellular life? I did mean, uh, 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 I did mean a simple life. Okay, I don't mean other lives. I mean simple life and I don't think that what I, I don't think is more strong than I don't believe. I don't think that what we've done here has anything to do with simple life at the beginning of the earth, of life in the earth. This is a scenario. It's like birds and, pla and planes that I mentioned earlier. I just, today I've been mentioning that a few times, I don't know why. But a, a birds, you see a bird, you wanna copy it. You don't copy a bird that flaps and all that. Icarus did that and he crashed. And so the Wright brothers got it right. They looked at the principles of physics and they were inventive and they used the 
internal combustion engine to help them copy the function of flight. The same thing with radio waves. Maxwell invented his equations and then Hertz was able to actually manipulate the, using the equations, he manipulated a, a, some sort of setup, a rig, they would call it, I suppose, where he actually made electromagnetic waves. And later, Mr. Marconi, Brown and company came and put radio together. It all was containing the uh, equations that Maxwell put together, but the radio waves that you, you produce, and some of which are carrying our words and images here today, are not the radio waves that are produced naturally by a, um, whatever events are taking place in the in interior of the sun or Jupiter, uh, just as uh, um, birds are different from planes and so on. So this is just what I have presented is a scenario that shows that uh, making things that behave like life does not require biochemistry, period. That's all it says. It also tells us, uh, and with it, of course, it's telling us that there may be many possibilities in many other planetary systems. And uh, mm, the safe thing to say is that it would be very simple life. Great. All right, well, that's it. That's the end of the questions. Uh, I want to thank you again, Juan, for a fantastic, fascinating uh, talk. And uh, thanks to everybody who's participated remotely. Uh, so uh, on behalf of everybody, I'm going to give you another round of applause. So we just have to imagine that 65 people are applauding you. Uh, so with that, that'll conclude uh, today's seminar. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at a future Astrobiology Seminar. Take care, everybody.